So we're back with part two of lecture number four. Where we left off with the previous lecture was with Bacon's Rebellion and the aftermath of that. How many of the wealthy landholding class in the southern colonies were deeply alarmed at any sort of prospective alliance between slaves and indentured servants and freemen. So what they will seek to do now is really kind of transition to a race-based form of slavery. Now slaves had existed in the Virginia colony as early as 1619 when the first shipload, a Dutch ship, dropped off about 20 or so black servants um, at that point in time. The numbers rose pretty slowly in the Virginia colony, at least to begin with. For example, by 1671, there were still only about 2,000 African slaves out of a general population of 40,000 or so. But what's really interesting is, is that in the Virginia colony, where slavery, African slaves are first introduced in North America, it appears that the condition of these earliest slaves was somewhat similar to that of indentured servants, meaning that we have court records showing that some of these earliest slaves were freed over time. Not all of them, but some of them were freed, and some of them went on to marry and accumulate property in their own name. A good example of this would be Anthony Johnson, for instance, who was uh, brought into the uh, colony in 1621 and was able to, after working for a period of about 12 years for the Bennett family, was given his freedom and at that point started accumulating property in his own name. However, within a generation or two of African slavery settling in in the Virginia colony, we start to see a push towards making this slavery permanent and making it strictly race-based, meaning that no white person could be uh, uh, enslaved and also that anyone who was of African ancestry, that should they be enslaved, that they can never work their way out of this condition. Um, and so slowly by the 1660s, 1670s, we're starting to see um, the legal noose uh, tightening on slavery in the Virginia colony. They're starting to close every loophole that might allow some of these slaves to ultimately become free men. Now, while Virginia Colony kind of experimented with slavery uh, during the first generation or so, in the Carolina Colony, which you'll notice was established much, much later in 1663, African slavery perpetual, that is to say lifelong slavery, was there from the get-go, and I mean from day one. Uh, there is no experimental phase in the Carolina colony. You'll notice from the map here that the original Carolina colony stretched from what we think of uh, as present-day North Carolina, South Carolina, and also uh, Georgia and uh, the northern portions of what we think of as Florida. So it was a much bigger land mass, and it was all kind of grouped under the heading of the Carolina colony. It will be much later that we'll end up see uh, this kind of being parceled out into to, uh, later a uh, North Carolina and then a uh, South Carolina and then of course a uh, Georgia uh, even beyond that so um, when we talk about slavery as being there from the get-go, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the founders of the Carolina colony were men who were invested in the slave trade. These founders of the Carolina colony uh, they made money off of the trade in human beings, right, through the Royal African Company. So they began to strongly encourage settlers to their colony to bring more slaves into that area. For instance, in order to attract uh, settlers to the Carolina colony, they were offered 20 acres of land for every male slave that was brought in, just free acreage for every male slave brought in. 10 acres were granted for every female slave brought into the early Carolina colony. And so very early on, we're going to see a, a perpetual, that is to say lifelong slavery, a very brutal form of slavery too, uh, introduced there since several of the founders had already had experience uh, with slavery uh, very cruel uh, system established on the sugarcane plantations of the Caribbean in Barbados. All right, so very quickly what you're going to see in the Carolina colony is uh, a, a sharp uptick in the number of African slaves as opposed to the rest of the white population there. Uh, you can see uh, much, much later, for instance, by 1790, that 42 percent of the population in South Carolina at that point were enslaved. This is going to cause some, some problems from the standpoint of the white population in South Carolina. They are going to be paranoid. There's really no other word for it truly paranoid about slave rebellions. The fact that there are so, there's such a high percentage of their population is enslaved, um, they are worried about retribution, and justly so.
right? And so because of this endemic fear among slave owners that as the numbers of slaves rose, so too would the number of slave rebellions, we see a very harsh legal code established in South Carolina. In 1696, the assembly passed a code that was noted for its barbaric provisions. For example, no slave could be taught religion. No slave could be manumitted. Right? And that term, manumission, means that the owner is deciding to free the slave for whatever reason. Well, in South Carolina, as the number of slaves grew as a proportion of the total population, now owners are forbidden by law from ever freeing their slaves. Again, the worry is that freed blacks would then try to incite a mass rebellion. So, uh, yeah, these are, are incredibly harsh laws meant to try and intimidate the slave population into uh, submission, essentially. The slave code, for example, um, uh, said that for a slave caught stealing items, the person was to be branded with a hot iron with the letter R on their right cheek for robbery. For the second offense, a slave would then be branded once more with a hot iron with an R on the left cheek. For the third offense, a slave caught cheating in the Carolina colony was to be executed. Any slave caught running away for the fourth time, for instance, in the Carolina colony could be castrated. So we're talking about just a totally brutal and inhuman legal code developing early on in Carolina as a testament to the fear among the slaveholding population. And their fears were justified. No human being likes to be held in bondage and abused at the whim of someone else. So it's not surprising, therefore, that the first and the largest slave rebellion that we see uh, in the colonies happens in what is now, by 1739, South Carolina. The Stono Rebellion will take place about 20 miles outside the city of Charleston. And um, we believe that the slaves that were involved in uh, this particular action were not only, you know, sort of rising up to defend their liberties and seek their freedom, but that they were likely heading towards Spanish Florida to the south of, uh, of their colony, where uh, several slaves who had left in recent years had traveled to uh, achieve their freedom uh, at the hands of the Spanish. So um, the Stono Rebellion, kind of a very graphic example of, of how um, slaves were, were human beings seeking their liberty, right? They were willing to, in some cases, commit murder to try and stop the enslavement, abuse, and murder of their own at the hands of, uh, of these slaveholders. And I'll say one other thing about the Stono Rebellion. In, in the wake of this rebellion being put down, uh, we will see that South Carolina will pass a newer, even more restrictive system of laws governing the, almost every aspect of a slave's life at that point in time. Uh, an incredibly harsh uh, new set of slave laws or codes will be enacted there. Now, interestingly, of the establishment of the colony of Georgia, uh, which will be really kind of the last of the, the original 13 colonies to be settled. Originally, slavery was banned from the early colony of Georgia, not due to humanitarian concerns for any actual, you know, uh, sympathy with the slaves. Instead, it had more to do with the fact that the founder of Georgia, of Georgia, James Oglethorpe, he was worried about the original settlers to Georgia having equality of opportunity. So slavery was banned really mainly because he wanted to make uh, Georgia a haven for people from poorer backgrounds. And he wanted everyone to have an equal opportunity to kind of work their way up through the system. And he was concerned that if slavery were allowed in the early colony, that you'd have people pouring across the line from South Carolina, for instance, uh, existing wealthy individuals simply bringing their slaves in and claiming all the land and kind of squeezing out poor farmers at that point in time. That will change, though, uh, in particular after uh, Oglethorpe and his troops are able to defeat the Spanish just south of uh, the Georgia colony and kind of secure the southern borders of the Georgia colony. Then we will see uh, a, a generation into uh, Georgia's development into a colony. We will see uh, enough agitation on the part of settlers there Everywhere else has slavery, why can't we? We will see that slavery will ultimately be introduced into the Georgia colony over time.